Oh, good day, everyone, and welcome to a belated edition of the weekend wrap for this week. My apologies, a little bit crook at my end, but we're back on deck and ready to go. And uh, we won't keep you guys waiting any longer. Let's get straight into it, shall we? Good evening, happy Tuesday night. I hope everyone had a good Easter and didn't miss us too much. Um, it was a, a shame that we miss out on the weekend wrap, normal time slot of Sunday night, but here we are and joining me as usual, uh, Maka and Nikki. Maka, how are you going after your week off? Um, well, I'm going okay. Mrs Maka's broken down, so I've been carting her all around the place today, but um, no, she'll come good. Oh, very good. And now love and best wishes to her, of course. And Nikki, Thanks, how are you going? Oh, uh, not like it is end of daylight savings. Like my body clock around. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a bit like that. Although at least I don't mind the end of it because at least we're going backwards. We're actually gaining an hour, so it's not quite so bad. Yeah, you guys still there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, just uh, not talkative. Uh, g'day to everyone who's on the chat. Uh, I'm pretty sure everything's working as normal, but if there's any dramas, let us know in the chat. Everyone on Discord and on YouTube and also on Twitch. G'day to everyone. Um, we won't keep it too long tonight because there has been a few days past since our massive win over Gold Coast, but we will crack straight into it. And first of all, a very quick look at the scores, I believe. What do you reckon, guys? Sounds like a good idea. Good idea, yep. right. Uh, okay, so Thursday night, uh, Collingwood uh, just going down the lines at the end. The lines 11.773 to Collingwood 11.672. Probably justice for the Lions there after the previous week against Geelong. Uh, Western Bulldogs giving North Melbourne a fair old spanking, uh, 25.17 to 167 to North Melbourne, 5.939, a margin there of way too many. Uh, North Melbourne, <laughs> stranglehold, a stranglehold on Jason Horn. Um, on Saturday, we had uh, Sydney just going along really nicely early doors. Uh, Sydney, 17.15, 117 to the Tigers 10, 12, 72. They're a margin of 45 points, if you don't mind. Uh, the Bombers getting up over a listless St Kilda. St Kilda would be really disappointed with that one. Uh, Essendon 22, 11, 143 to St Kilda 9, 14, 68. Uh, West Coast Eagles. Sorry, go on. I was and just going to say, St Kilda might be slightly disappointed with a certain number five. <laughs> First game back though, Nick. Oh, come on, Macca. Six touches. <laughs> Jesus. I had uh, to look yeah. up the players to see if he was actually playing. Well, I did too, actually. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> um, yeah, buyers are more there, I reckon, in a couple of weeks. Interesting article, actually. We won't digress too much, but interesting article by Ben Dexon on Fox Footy the other day uh, declaring that the possible death of pure inside mids, given the uh, change in style, and I don't, didn't necessarily disagree with him, and it, it doesn't all go well for blokes like Brad Crouch, who uh, that's their bread and butter. So uh, anyway, um, West Coast 16-12-108 over the pair, 11-5-71. The pair got the selection all wrong, in my opinion, playing 93 tools up forward, but anyway. Yep, yeah, uh, absolutely right there, Fiend. Yeah. Yeah, they couldn't make up their mind who to drop, so they played them all and to their detriment. You've got to say uh, this for Kenny, though. He, he lost a primary final doing exactly the same thing on a wet yeah, night. Yeah. He's a bloody idiot. Backs, him, <laughs> backs himself in, doesn't he? <laughs> Although I, I did take great delight in the masterclass of ruck work you got from Nick Nadanui. 
Oh, that yeah. was just a pleasure yeah. pleasure to watch. Against quality Ruckman too, if you don't mind. Um, not a bad effort. Um, anyway, Carlton 16-13 getting on the board over Fremantle 9 64 a margin there of 45 points. Melbourne continuing the Giants' hapless start to the uh, proceedings and the Giants have uh, got a couple more injuries and problems there. 11 68 the Giants. Melbourne 15-12-102. And Geelong getting up over Hawthorne, uh, not convincingly by any stretch. Uh, Geelong ten nine sixty nine to uh, Hawthorne nine ten sixty four. So margin there of five points to Geelong. Uh, yeah, interesting round of footy, particularly Sydney. I guess it's uh, unexpected. But when you think, when you look at the uh, academy guys, they've got. I guess it isn't so unexpected. Uh, you're talking about Sydney, yeah. Well, yeah. they've got, they got a beautiful blend of um, some very experienced players, some players who've been playing now for about two or three years and are just coming into really good quality football and, say, about three or four or three new boys who can all play already. So that, they've just got a very, very beautiful blend, I think, and that, that, they'll definitely make the eight, in my opinion, and... Uh, they are building up beautifully for the future. Yes, nice, and, not, and not we, a bad little quick rebuild from these ones. Yeah, and, and they do, we know Richmond, they haven't looked convincing at the start. They've had the latest start with everybody else and they've kind of just ticked along slowly, but it was very interesting to see how they didn't really cope and, and couldn't get back into the game for, for quite a bit against Sydney. Yeah. Yeah, PJ on the chat. Sydney has a beautiful blend of academy picks, academy picks and academy picks. They've had the rising star <laughs> yep. nom for the first three weeks and they're all from the academy. So, uh, And then they've got Heaney and a couple of others. So uh, a nice little leg up that uh, we never got. But anyway, let's not complain. A quick look at the ladder. Uh, sees the Bulldogs on top uh, with uh, Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, Port, West Coast... Richmond, Geelong, and the Crows just hanging in there on two wins, and then a whole bunch of people. Uh, probably the notable ones out of the eight uh, are Brisbane and GWS, second to bottom, yet to get off the mark, and with a horrible percentage, two seventy-three percent. So there, it's a long way back for the uh, GWS Giants. Well, I've never understood why they re-signed their coach for another three years, Fiend. I think he's. He's had Rolls Royce sides and mismanaged them. That a lot of those players have gone, and he hasn't really got a Rolls Royce side now. He's got a few quality players left, but uh, I see nothing but doom for them coming up in the next three years. Dead man walking, in my opinion, Maka. Absolute dead and man. And especially walking. now, especially now with those injuries. Well, and to be yeah. honest with you, for the people that have watched the um, the documentary on on Amazon, uh, Leon Cameron does not come across well. He does no, not come not across at all. as a modern-day coach. He's a, he seems to be, um, you know, fixated on mantras and, and old-school, you know, Ron Barassi-style G-ups, but there's not a lot of substance in in, in what he's offering up there. And uh, if, if, I was a, if I was a club in the coaching market, I think Leon Cameron would be one that I'd be looking at, to be honest with you. You mean anyway. to get him? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, if, if he was... if it, I mean, there's there's coaches that come onto the market that are sought after, you know. Uh, Don Pike was very quickly brought back into the fold. I mean, there's other co I mean, if Damien Hardwick or Alistair Clarkson came on the market, they'd be snapped up quickly. Ross Lyon, of course. Uh, but Leon Cameron, if he came on the market, I think it would be very lukewarm. Very oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought you were saying the opposite because, no, I don't think anybody would pick him up at all. He's got no. a he's, – he's wasted what he's had and yeah. uh, I, I think he'll definitely be replaced if not this year, uh, next year. The only reason I'd say why well, not, maybe not this end of this year is yeah. because they, they signed him up for three years and that'll be a very huge payout. But, gee, and that, the AFL would have to pay that out because they subsidise him. But, gee whiz, they made a massive mistake re-signing him. So let, let's just – just before, we're digressing, but it's an interesting point, Macca. You say the AFL would have to pay him out, but that would surely still come under GWS's soft cap, wouldn't it? 
Yes, it would. It would, but um, it's AFL money. That's what I'm saying. And um, I understand. I understand it's AFL money, but with the soft cap, it still limits their their spending power. So whilst you know they're being funded by the AFL, unless the AFL want to make up their own rules for their little Western Sydney love child, that's what I know, was suggesting. It, it's that's, yeah. it, it's it's going to limit their football department spending just the same as it limited our football department spending last year. Well, you know, if they don't do something yeah, about it's GWS versus us. Yeah, exactly. And they'll, but, bail, uh, and they'll bail them out. I'm, I'm yeah. not. Yeah, I'm not saying they won't bail them out financially. What I'm saying is that it will still count towards their soft cap. They can only spend a certain amount of money before they start get a, getting a luxury tax. And you would think that the other clubs would be ensuring that that is transparent, so it would oh. still it would still have an impact on their ability to, to bring in, you know, coaches and, and ancillary staff, etc. if the AFL are being genuine. No, they're not. They're not. They make up rules for... They've been making up rules for Gold Coast forever. <laughs> so, uh, but that is, anyway. you know, they, they, they won't hesitate if it's necessary. Oh, no, of course not. Um, all right, let's look at us. Uh, and, look, it was a very gritty win on uh the weekend uh adelaide 14 11 95 to gold coast 12 13 85 a margin there of 10 points in the end if you have a look at the uh the little scoring worm there uh, it shows that the lead swapped uh, quite a few times uh, we got out to a good lead uh sorry uh, gold coast got out to a good lead early and then we just swamped them in the second quarter and then they came back in the third, and then it was a bit nip and tuck in the last. So, uh, and we were good enough to hang on. So I thought it was a very, very gritty win uh, by Adelaide. Probably not our best game in terms of uh, executing game plans, but uh, we did what we needed to do. Well, the Car- one thing that is, building. Nicky's. I was just about to bloody well say that. I'll be quiet now. No, you and she's spot on. That was exactly what I was going to say. Um, to me, it, it just four times we had to fight back in the, uh, each of the quarters, and we did. And, it just, and the team showed character. We may not have the best team because it's a very inexperienced team, but one thing it's got already is character, and it just shows uh, having quality uh, coaches with our young lads uh, that they are definitely on the right track. Uh, their game plan. I like the idea of their game plan, yeah. but more importantly, I just like the fact that they've got fight into these boys. They fight, they, they scratch, they claw, they keep going, and they've got character. And I think uh, that's how you build a football team. And I think we are really on the right in the right direction. Nikki, <laughs> basically, yeah, the, the same kind of thing. I mean, what impressed me the most was the fact that and I know you alluded to it in the game day um, chat we had here on Discord, is is very much that ability to change it up a little bit during a, if, during a quarter. If something's not going right, this is what we'll do, what we'll fix. I was also really impressed with that crowd in the, the first quarter when they got that run on at the start. The crowd just went, you know what, no. And just... It, it was just so organic that we just started yelling, you know, to yeah. try and help get them up. And, and that's what you need with the younger team is they, they still need a bit of that. Um, you know, and but it was also what, some of our older heads I yeah. thought had a really good game. A, a crowd will, will um, get involved and get invested in a team that is showing fight. And I think... At times in the past, the crowd has gone, been accused of being a little bit silent, and it's usually because Crows teams tend to either win well or capitulate. Um, but what we're seeing with this team um, is a, a, a fair amount of grit and determination, but also um, very good knowledge of what is required of them under certain circumstances. And, and Matthew Nix in the press conference afterwards alluded to what you were saying, Nick, with regards to changing a few things up and made it very clear that it was player driven. Um, you know, it wasn't, I mean, the coaching yeah. staff tweaked things a, at the breaks, but during the course of the quarters, the players were driving changes and driving structures, etc. And look, 
I don't think we've seen that from a Crows team for a very long time, um, if at all. Uh, you, you, we've all followed the Crows long enough to know that if yeah. if the going gets tough, is I could count on one hand, I reckon, the memorable comebacks that we've had um, under circumstances where we've been jumped like Gold Coast jumped us um, and where we've been challenged at various points throughout the game. Um, and it showed last week against Sydney, even though we lost, we were able to turn it around and stay in the game. Um, and this week against Gold Coast, we were able to get ourselves back into the game very quickly um, through just some minor adjustments. Uh, and that, to me, is the most pleasing thing because that... Uh, remember last year, Rory Sloan uh, went to the coach and said he needed to simplify his message a little bit. Well, obviously, that message has gotten through because the players now appear to be very keyed into what's going on and have bought in completely to what is going on and are able to communicate on the on the deck in real time uh, to make adjustments when ne- necessary. Yeah, and, and in very much in that first quarter, that little bit of run on, what was often happening out of the middle was that the ruck for Gold Coast would actually stay back once the ball hit the deck. And we know Rob goes in to become an extra midfielder. So all they were doing was flicking it out to him, free, bang, into their forward line straight away. That's what happened those first three times. Then Rob didn't go in. They obviously identified it within the middle group that that's what had happened. And he stayed back. He made sure he manned up. They didn't have that outlet anymore. Correct. And, and I just thought that was really smart of that group to pick that quite quickly um, and just make that, that little adjustment. Um, yeah. And there was there was other stuff throughout the, the night, but I just really liked what I saw overall from the whole team. Yeah. PJ on the chat makes a comment about uh, uh, Sloaney on the, on the Amazon docos, you know, um, uh, talking about learning the game plan, and as soon as they did, um, we started winning games. But the other thing we can't forget about last year with regards to a new group and a new coach and new game plan is that they weren't able to train as a full group for the majority of the season, at least for the first half of the season. They weren't allowed to train as a full team. So trying to teach a bunch of kids a new game plan under those circumstances is pretty much impossible. You know, and uh, as soon as they were able to get in and train together, um, they seemed to gel very quickly, um, and that's carried through to this season. So, uh, Nix has obviously got an eff- uh, an effective plan. Um, uh, it it's a, a plan that can score, but it's also a plan that can defend. And um, I guess at the moment we're finding out which players uh, can stand up to that plan and actually execute and which players may need to uh, be replaced or fall by the wayside. Yeah, PJ also made a very, very, very relevant point about the uh, standing for the man on the mark. Um, if, you look, if you watch the Geelong-Hawthorne uh, game, um, I, I'll tell you now, Geelong cannot win the Premiership because they're still playing their same old kick, mark, kick, mark, kick, mark, kick game. And the, t- the, t- the team that will win the Premiership this year is that the team that... Uh, uh, takes advantage of the stop rule and plays on very quickly, forward movement all the time, run, 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 and that's and that's the style that we are doing. And uh, if you look back when we were playing Gold Coast, we actually forced them into that uh, little. Uh, and then you have to look at the stats; we'll back it up. Chip, kick, chip, kick, instead of attack, attack, attack. Their first few minutes, they managed to do it, but after that, we managed to stop it. And it's going to weaken zone. Zones are, you'll have to have a very good zone to be able to stop in the future. And uh, at times, let's go more man on man rather than zone to be able to stop it. Um, and that's the advantage of the if you build your game plan around this uh, stop rule and the change. Um, and I know we have done that by the way we play. I think that's that's going to help you help a team go forward. Whereas teams that stick with the uh, chip kick game, they go. I don't think they can possibly win a flag. And that's what we also do. You could see that we exploited that against Geelong as well in the very oh, first 100%. game. Yeah, 100%. And, the, and they just do not – and we know they've got a coach who just actually doesn't know how to coach. Can't you know, coach. Cannot only, coach. Yeah. He only knows how to do Bob Thompson's game plan. 
So I just want to uh, quickly, if we uh, can, just want to, I thought what we might spend some time doing um, at the beginning of shows from now on is just have a look at, with the benefit of hindsight, just have a look at selection and see whether there were areas where we might have uh, made some changes. And really, from my perspective, uh, the, we've got two problem. What I would say problems at the moment. Uh, uh, Riley O'Brien is is uh, sadly out of touch in terms of his ruck work and also around the ground at the moment uh, in terms of his overhead work. Um, and Billy Frampton was a nice romantic um, uh, <laughs> selection first round, um, but I think we're starting to see Billy's limitations. Uh, he doesn't one grab marks. Um, and he's not really prone to uh, to controlling contests, so I don't. I'm I'm fairly comfortable that Billy isn't the long term answer at centre half forward. But aside from that, I actually felt like we got selection pretty right. We we seem to guess the Suns' um, structure pretty well. Uh, they only really went with the one big tall Benny King. Uh, obviously, they had Burgess at centre half forward, but he's really only medium, so we could cover him with a Dude or a or a uh, Jake Kelly. And in any event, uh, Burgess was required in ruck when uh, the big fella Wits went down with what's turned out to be unfortunately an ACL. Um, so I actually felt like our structure and our our uh, selection was pretty good. What did you think, Maka? Exactly as you said it, and you did dominate the one guy that I didn't like in the, from round one, where he was double grabbing. Uh, it, right from the start, he's been double grabbing and uh, and usually not finishing at the mark. Um, and uh, even when he's taken, it's been usually a double grab rather than a clump. He puts Kane, he puts in a clump, but he's, to me, he's uh, a second rater, um, and I don't think he's the answer. Um, I would much, much prefer to see uh, Himmelberg in there because uh, Himmelberg does, he can clunk them. Uh, Himmelberg grab. has been playing like absolute ass in the twos, Maka. Well, that's, forget that's, what the I just feed, said. <laughs> that's the feedback. But I actually saw him on the weekend. Uh, Dad and I went down to Norlunga and I think he may come back in soon. He played like shit on the weekend. I was there. I actually did. No, I, who told you he played like shit? My eyes. <laughs> but he's I got watch, a, you know, I watch the stream. He's got a, he's got a better uh, view than you have, Nikki. <laughs> oh, yeah, on the screen where you actually do, you only see what the camera work shows you. Um, his ruck work actually in the centre was a lot better than anything we're going to get out of Frampton. His ruck work was actually very good in the SANFL. Um, the problem you've got is the delivery, unfortunately, into that forward line, the pressure playing against South Adelaide, SANFL, you've got to take that into account. What I saw from him, I actually think he might be closer to coming back in than what a lot of people don't realise. Um, Tillthorpe is about probably six weeks away or maybe longer until he Why, actually Nikki? learns that he's a forward and he needs to lead him from in front. No, but hang on a minute. Hang on just a bloody minute, Nikki. I'm because I'm Riley, asking PJ because PJ talks about Tilthorpe. Riley, Riley knows that Tilthorpe that he's a <laughs> Riley knows that Tilthorpe. Riley knows that he's a forward. Uh, the Not club the way need the club need to play him as a forward and forget this playing him on a wing to free him up rubbish. They did play him as a forward and he was shit house. Yeah. Well And then I they put him on the actually, wing. Yeah. Yes he was. He was freaking shit house. And when they put him on the wing, he actually got into the game and then they put him back up forward and he played a little bit better. But he still persists in trying to be behind his defender. He doesn't like watch the play up the ground. He doesn't move naturally. He doesn't read the play naturally. What? He did I... not on the weekend. I was, Nikki. I was very, I was very disappointed in him. Very, very, very disappointed. Nikki. Nikki, I, I'd oh, like I... people. I'd like people in in the comments, uh, uh, live, or if you're watching this on demand or listening to it on Spreaker. I would 
like to hear your comments on that because um, I, I've been of the view from the very beginning that I think we just need to play Riley. Uh, we just need to play him in the A's. He's not going to learn anything in the twos. Um, well, he really isn't, in my opinion. Whether well, he's playing good back. or bad. And, and sorry, Macca, just to finish that off, I probably feel the same way about Himmelberg, to be honest with you. I, I think Himmelberg is a confidence player, and I actually think the club has done the wrong thing by him. I, under, I understand that he was a bit behind the eight ball fitness-wise uh, to begin with, um, but uh, Elliot did a lot of good things in the back half of 2020, and I think he deserved first crack. And um, I just uh, think that he needs to be given an opportunity to get in there um, and and play, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, look, uh, I'm in the same camp as you, Fiend. Um, he, I understand that he, he might come up and uh, play in the in the in the big time and struggle a little bit at first but that's the whole idea he'll be surrounded by players like walker etc quality mm. players who can tell him 100%. how to percent how, how to play 100%, his no, where, Macca. 100%. well what while he's playing with the scrubbers in the twos i don't think he's going to learn it and um so yeah look i don't expect him to star right away and um, uh he will make errors etc but the poll point is um he he is picked we picked him He's played. He's played SAFL with men for a year and a half before this, so That's right. he should be ready. He should be ready to step up. And okay, it might be that he, now, Nicky, be quiet. He, he just want to finish this because he might be struggling a little bit. In, he might be struggling just a little bit because of the fact that he did have not the perfect preseason. So it might take him one or two weeks running around in the twos. Also well, got but a nice I, head knock last week too. Yeah. So I think that. He should be in there. He can't do worse than Frampton, in my opinion. I don't really don't think he can do worse than Frampton. And as he builds up confidence, he'll learn how to play in the big time, as I say. He'll be advised by people around him who know how to do it. 100%, Mac. And the boys in the chat are making the point that I was going to make. There are over 10 top-ups in the SNFL. Yeah, there was. That you're not going to get the system that you're going to get in the AFL. They're not playing the game plan. that uh, They can't execute the game plan uh, that the club is trying to instill. I, I maintain that Riley is not gaining one single thing in the twos, and they just need to get him up there. Uh, look what uh, Sydney have done with Logan McDonald. Uh, yep. Similar similar background. He played in the ones last year and did all right, and they've just chucked him straight in, and uh, he's done pretty well. So I would like to see them get uh, Riley in. But if they are going to sit and hold on Riley, I would certainly like them to get Elliot in irrespective uh, of his um, of his form so um, so uh, look overall uh, the only other aspect I'd like to look at in terms of uh, selection before we move on to the head-to-head -head stats is is it is it a selection that that smacks of rebuild Macca uh, do you see uh, areas where an older player who's going a right should have given away to a younger player that we need to get some games into? Well, at the moment, no. Um, on paper, uh, you could argue that, but on performance at the moment, no, I don't think so. Um, yeah, but is it all about performance, Mac? Well, we have to have somebody knocking the door down to pick them in the first place. I, I don't want to give yeah, anybody but we've just, a game. Yeah, but we've just talked about that. It's very hard to do in an SANFL team with a dozen ring-ins. Very hard to do unless unless you're at the cold face as a midfielder. It's very hard to do. Like a, a, a guy like Frankie Worrell, how, how's he going to push his case? Well, Worrell is the only one that I, that, that I would give a game to. Again, that I think is at the stage where he's ready to play. Um, Jones has to obviously get some form before he can. Um, and uh, you know, Fogarty, he's got the same problem. Um, but no, Worrell, Worrell's playing okay, and he, I think he's got the ability to play at this level. Um, but I think also Borlase is another one. But uh, whether they are they absolutely ready yet to knock somebody out? Uh, they may be during the season, and that may well happen. But I don't think so at this stage. But Mac, we're trying to rebuild. It's not about wins right now. 
it's about getting games into kids that you think are going to make it. And Worrell, I think, is one. Uh, Fogarty, I think, is another one. Um, these kids, and uh, Borlase looks to be really pushing himself up the pecking order too, which is an interesting development. Yeah, um, yeah he's good. He's so good. You know, there's a couple of others. Uh, we're going to have Luke Pedler coming on soon. Uh, yeah. I... You know, we've we've given Sam Berry a run. I reckon Sam Berry might be good for a spell soon. Maybe one more week, give him a spell and give another lad a go. Um, the selection, there's two forward selections that I think uh, are questionable. Um, Tommy Lynch has started the year really well, but I, th I felt like he was back to a bit of his old tricks um, against Gold Coast. A few scrubber kicks and uh, a bit lacking in a bit of composure. But the one I really want to talk about is Lachlan Murphy. Because as much as Murphy never dies trying and will always give you 10,000%, I did still see him trying to play like a tool. I did still see him flying for marks when he should have stayed down. And I just wonder whether his spot is where we might be able to shoehorn a, a, a Darcy Fogarty into. Um... I don't, but I, I don't know. Is he capable of playing that role, though? Well, it's not about roles. It's about spots. I mean, you you pick a team and then you assign roles. I mean, personally, I would have Darcy Fogarty in for Tommy Lynch um, and Tex and Darcy sharing that lead-up, that high lead-up role. Um, but I think there's also an uh, a, a way in which we can get someone in via Lachlan Murphy's spot simply because I don't know whether Lachlan is the long-term solution. I would have said that about Ned McHenry a couple of weeks ago, but I think Ned McHenry is starting to come along all right, and I'd, I'm happy to persevere with him because he's a young lad. Murphy, I don't know, is in our next premiership team. Well, you know, and you, you may be right, but I do like the idea of three smalls um, because... Um, and I know Murphy does make that mistake of flying at times when he should be staying down. Um, regularly, Macca, regularly he does that. Yeah, and you're right about McHenry. I, I, you know, I'm, I was dubious that he'd ever make a play, but he, he is starting to get better each week and he's starting to look like he's getting the idea. And I have to even agree with Nicky. She says he's doing his spot and he has. Um, so he's in. Um, I think young Rory's earned, earned his spot. Uh, and Murphy would be the one that would be in the danger if one of those uh, was going to go. Um, I don't know, Fane. I, I, I'm sure that, that the thinking with the boys at the moment, the, you know, the, the uh, selection team, is that I think that if a player is going well enough, he will get a chance. Look, I think so. And, Nicky, sorry, would um, blocking you. I'll give you a crack in a second. Um, I... I'm just very, con oh, I'm not concerned. I'm not concerned at all. I, I think Matthew Nix has got the right attitude that we play to win and when we go out on the ground, we play to win. But I think the rebuild is, uh, well, it's incumbent on the selection committee to make sure that they've got one eye on the game and one eye on development. Um, which we haven't done well at, at in the past. And, you know, we've got a few blokes that are, either left the club or on the edge of the club now, like Chase Jones, who, are, who you can testify to that. We haven't been good at blooding players. And, um, you know, notwithstanding the fact that Sydney are full of academy players, um, we've lost a, a number of first-round draft picks over the last three or four years through lack of blooding appropriately, you know. And I think, you know, I'm all for Matthew Nick's aiming to win the game and the players to win the game because that's why you play the sport. But I think it's the selection committee's um, job uh, to ensure that one eye is kept on development. Wouldn't you agree, Nick? Yeah, and um, what I was just talking about in the the chat was because um, you talked about, um, I think, New Church um, or others mentioned in the chat. I mean, he actually, his defensive work, even up until the last quarter, he was running hard into our yeah. defense to, to get his body in the way and everything else. It showed really good rate capacity, running to the right spots and was providing a really great link out. So whilst he's slight and 
I think if he was in any other team, he wouldn't be playing in an SNFL league team. Mm. I saw enough there. Chase Jones, I think, will be gone by the end of the season. He just does not live up to his name at all. If he thinks he can't make the contest, he gives up. And then they start to run away. And then he has to sprint. I've lost a and, bit of faith and, in Chase. I'm for, I'm, I know, and and it just really disappointed me. He did that a number of times. Um, so I th- I also found it very interesting, particularly for Lynch, is that Davis played up forward fairly exclusively mm. in the SANFL in I'm, that very similar role. Yeah. So I think there's there's some nice pressure that'll be coming um, from Lynch around that role. Um, they did use Fogarty a lot in the midfield and, you know, SNFL level, I'm big G for him in there. I mm. think he can actually play that role really well and it keeps mm. him involved in the game because that's his problem, I think, up forward is he gets a little lost sometimes to be keeping him involved in the game. And um, so how they use him in the AFL, I'm very keen to see what Nix is going to do with him because by the sounds of it, from what the words we're getting out of Nix's mouth, and I don't think he's one that kind of um, – he's not that political speak in terms of hiding his true intentions like we've had from previous coaches. I, I think mm. you, you, you kind of get a, a fair hint of that's the way he's thinking. Um, I also think that Worrell is very close. Um, there were some good points in the the chat that possibly when Hamill might get a little bit tired because Hamill with his concussion issues last year and everything else, um, I think he might get a little bit tired. So, And we do know, even though we've got McPherson for a while, he has had an issue with soft tissue. So fingers crossed it doesn't happen. <laughs> but I, I think Worrell's that nice size. He can actually play on a tall ball. Um, and very much so that Ball A's took a massive step forward than what I anticipated. I knew he had some really good skills, but he just reads the play so naturally and wants to take it on. Got caught a couple of times, but you know what? The kid gave it a go and mm. just, you know, see if he learns from it. So I think there's, I think we've got the right balance at the moment. Um, but it's going to going to be interesting to see in the next couple of weeks if we start getting a little bit of rotation going on. Mm, it looks like you've a bit of trouble in chat there. Yeah, too. Yeah, we'll just you guys keep talking and I'll ditch these dickheads out of chat. Okay, oh, yeah. bit of fun. Um, yeah, just, just talking about uh, Chase Jones. I, I think the only hope for Chase Jones, I think, is that he needs a, um, somebody like a Jenny Williams to sit with him and work with him mentally because at the moment. Uh, you described him very well, Nicky, and he gives it. He did when he first came here. He used to battle and fight, and in, remember that game yeah. when, he, uh, when he played against the Bulldogs in the last game of the year, not last year, but the year before. And uh, he personally nearly got us back into the game and uh, uh, showed that he can play football. It's not. It's not. Not that he can't play football. At the moment, in his head, he can't play football, and. Um, so it's a question of if we're ever going to get anything out of him. I think it can only be drawn out of him not by the coaches. They, they can help and not by his teammates. They can help. But somebody's got to convince him that he can actually play football because at the moment I don't believe he thinks he can. And the other one which really concerns me is just Mackesy that, uh, uh, I mean, he was a pick six or something, I think, and uh, that, he just does not look like he wants to be here. He, yeah, Ballarat it was at the yeah. uh, think for Jones. Oh, yeah, that was a great game he did in the AFL. We thought, oh, this is a great lead on to the next season, you know, great way to end the year for him, confidence high. And I think yeah. it was also, was it earlier that year was where we had him and McHenry down mud pit at Norwood Oval it was, one, I think it was a Friday night game, and just – absolutely deciding we're not going to lose. And it was Hamill and Scholl as well. We are not going to lose this game. And they got, they picked that SNFL team up, basically the four of those young guys on their shoulders and just went, let's win this. And they did. And that was one of those games that made me sit up and notice him a lot. And 
I'd already started to notice Hamill and Scholl, but they did a great tag team as well in defence of really bottling down on um, – oh, I can't remember his name – from Norwood, their very fast player who used to be on our list. Yeah, what I was going to say about James, look, in that – not last year, but the year before, and that including that game at Ballarat where he got 18 possessions, he averaged 14 possessions for the last three games or five, five games, something like that. Then um, last year he had, he played fifteen games and he only averaged eight possessions a game, so he's really disappearing up his backside. And then this year in the two games that he played, um, he got well just didn't even get the ball, or one game whatever he was he just couldn't get the ball. So you you, you don't lose your ability, you lose your confidence, you lose your self belief, and uh, that kid's got none. And the other one, Mackesy, I don't. He hasn't got the want. I, I think he definitely think he's going home at the end of the year. Which is which is a real pity. Because um, we won't get back what he's worth. No, unfortunately. And it's, to me, when I look at Chase Jones, part of the problem was he's a pure midfielder. But in the AFL, he has to learn how to play half forward, and he gets lost at half forward. But you can compare him to um, Harry Schoenberg, put him on a half-forward flank and he just makes it his own. But he's also very damaging when he's in the midfield with the limited, you know, opportunities that he gets there. And and that kind of just made me go, what's up with with Jones? Because he has he had all those great attributes. We've seen him actually perform and we know he can do it we know he can actually have that mindset to do it but just something seems to have been switched unfortunately now whether we can get that switch turned back on that's up to the coaching staff yeah i don't know i just i really don't know to be honest with you um but you know the thing is that we've got some depth which means that we can afford um like these players have got pressure on them now so uh, you know it once they hit the club, it doesn't matter where we took them. And yes, it does point to um, errors in recruiting strategies or you know player identification or what whatnot, uh, and that's a different conversation. But once they're in the club, it doesn't matter where they got picked. And Sam Berry's a uh, a classic example of that. So if Fish and Chase and those types they don't come up, then uh, you know we've got players now. A uh, uh, ball ace uh, for Fisher definitely. Um, and a few other midfielders uh, for Chase that are champing at the bit. So yeah. it's disappointing for those lads, and it's disappointing for the recruiting staff, I think, and maybe it points a little bit to development, although you couldn't say that about Fisher McAsee. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, our depth is good enough right now. Yeah, and uh, as Nicky quite rightly said, you know, Butts has developed uh, beautifully and, and and thank God he has with the fact, you know, we're just reading today that uh, and hearing today that Talia probably won't be available for 10 to 12 weeks. Mm. So uh, uh, we are relying on Butts and if Butts goes down, then it's going to have to be a Borlase and uh, God help if it has to be a Mackesy. Uh, well. Well, and that's the thing, Mac. I think with Borlase there, I think we can uh, we can be a little bit more confident. Um, all right. Yeah, let's... he's a really good size, and I actually really like the prospect of those two working together in the future. Yeah. All right. Let's look at some head-to-head stats. Um, we both ag- well, we all agree then that they got selection pretty right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, just some philosophical things that might might be tweet. Let's look at head-to-heads um, for the game against Gold Coast. Um, we ended up uh, winning the disposal count 371-329. Uh, um, Kick-to-handball ratio was probably fairly standard for us. So have a look at Gold Coast kick-to-handball ratio. They really came in with a kick strategy, didn't they? 230 yep. kicks to uh, 99 handballs. Um, and, you know, it showed in their disposal efficiency, I think, because I don't know whether they're quite good enough to pull that off. They're under 70% disposal efficiency, um, whereas we ran at 75%. Apologies, I haven't got the quarter by quarter. I was too crook to get all that shit happening. Um, our efficiency inside 50 was good, 54.5%, which is what you want. Uh, having a look at the um, the clearance work, um, surprisingly, we still won the hit. It really didn't look like we were winning the hit-outs, did it? 
But we still won the hit out, 36-34. Yeah, but we were way behind until uh, which went off, though. Um, yeah, well, that's true, Riley, yeah. The last quarter yeah. would have been pretty big, wouldn't it? Yeah, Rob, no, Rob was massive in the last quarter. If you, if I, had, I did see the breakdown of his stats, and he was miserable at three-quarter time, and yeah. he probably doubled or tripled, no, he probably tripled his uh, overall stats in that last yeah. quarter. Yeah, yeah. Um, clearances, uh, the Suns were on top, um, uh, certainly in centre clearances uh, by three, but stoppage clearances isn't a stat that we've been losing, so Nixie would have been a little bit disappointed about that, I think, uh, and it took, and a lot of that disparity, I think, would have been in the first quarter. Uh, because it took Rory Sloan to uh, really get the team on his back and and uh, turn that around. We were quite uh, lopsided in clearances uh, at the beginning of the game. Um, possession count. Uh, have a look at the uncontested possessions. For a team that was trying to maintain possession uh, by kicking the ball, uh, we flogged uh, the Suns in un under uncontested possession, 218 to 169, which is quite surprising. Sorry, what was that stat again, Fiend? Un uncontested possessions. Uh, we were up 218 to 169, and that was despite um, Gold Coast using a, a very high kick ratio to try and maintain possession of the ball. It's, yeah. it's a way we were flicking it through that midfield, just that fast movement. I think that's where what? that kind of... Bloody oath, Nick. You're stealing my lines tonight. You're very really <laughs> good at it. No, great minds think alike, Macca. Great minds think alike. Okay, I'll buy that. No, but you're quite right. That's exactly what it was. That the once we did take a, when they make an error with that kick, that chip kick business and kicking it around, you will ultimately bring yourself undone. And when they when they did that and we got hold of it, as Nicky said, we would we rushed it forward and we were flicking the ball around with handballs. We would have used a lot more handballs than them. And the whole idea was to try and get somebody out in the open so that they could. Uh, get a better usage of the ball. And I I do like our game plan. It, it, you can see that it's, yeah, hold them and hold them, but once you've got it, attack, and, and it's very good. I tell you, the thing, that, the thing that I have noticed in a couple of weeks now is uh, our ability to regroup defensively uh, on, on the switch-up because against Sydney in that second quarter, we saw that um, uh, we just couldn't get the ball back off them. Uh, and we were spending a lot of time chasing, and then we reconfigured after half time, and we and we um, we covered the ground differently. We had areas of the ground um, uh, manned where previously we were just ch chasing tail, and we did the same thing against uh, Gold Coast. We seem to have we're not quite man on man, but we certainly have density in certain areas. Uh, you know, depending on where the ball is, so. They've obviously identified uh, that they need uh, player density, um, you know, within that 15 to 20 metre chip kick, but then also the bailout long. And so you you, you notice when when uh, we started to slow Gold Coast down, a lot of it was because of where our players were positioned, not necessarily one-on-one, -on -one, man man-on-man old school, but certainly focused on certain zones on the ground. And we were quite prepared to let them go laterally because then we would just shift across and basically have the same configuration on the opposite wing. So um, it looks really solid and it's not quite as taxing as what you would think because players uh, um, automatically move to a certain section of the ground depending on where the ball is. Now, beautifully described there, Fiend. That's exactly how it was. The, the, they are moving, to, as you say, across the ground, and they are, the, instead of doing the, the standard zone where you give a fair bit of latitude but you're standing all over the place, we are, we are actually standing much closer to the player, which then uh, does put a lot more pressure on the, on the yeah. kick to be accurate. And, if they, you know, it also does uh, give the opportunity to spoil or get the ball out of bounds. Um, so uh, I really, I really like the, the structure. Um, I noticed that uh, teams that try to use the conventional zone over the weekend, having watched all the game, they were scored against quite easily. Whereas, yes. uh, whereas the teams that did this this much tighter approach zone, and um, almost not quite man a one for one, but it's almost that. Um, yeah, they did a lot better. So I, I think the old conventional zone is ha, has been tweaked 
to be to put a little bit a lot more pressure on, on the kick and it's also in doing that um it's particularly in defense as to which players actually structure that up so you would often have smithers on one side and you have duday on the other as that one that was slightly looser to come across to be that intercept and those are the two that are very that are pretty good at doing that or like for smithers he's he's a very good outlet kick that will use him for that so it's it's not just that structure of being closer it's also the players that are within oh, those zones in a way it, yeah. and it's really Agreed. clever well, really I clever. think they do. I think they do have uh, designated certain players, um, which is smart, in my opinion. Um, Mac, that uh, Hawthorne grid or the Wiggles web um, that used to uh, bamboozle teams, uh, as you rightly point out, it doesn't work anymore because of the play on style and, and the uh, the stand on the mark rule, because yeah. you can ch- you can chip your way through those, and I guess that's what I was referring to that um, the web is tighter in certain. Like, I, th- I think teams are starting to work out, all right, we're prepared to give that kick, but we're not prepared yeah. to give that kick. So we're prepared to let you switch uh, as long because we'll have you covered. We're not really prepared to give you the, the hit up 30 metre diagonal into the corridor. And we want to make the bailout a really difficult option for you down the line. So you, you watch as, as teams, and this is where Geelong have not developed at all, um, for example, uh, you watch as because you can only have eighteen players on the ground, and the web was a real and the uh, Clarkson grid was a really good way of maximising your coverage on the ground. But eighteen players on the ground isn't enough to do that when you've got such a play on style. Um, and Mac, you'll know this because I'll tell you what it reminds me of, and I'm not trying to be parochial here, but it reminds me of when Jack Odie brought in the run on style. For Sturt back in the 60s and it just cut mm. teams up because yep. it was a completely different style of football yep you're right yeah and i'm not that old but i've seen footage oh no <laughs> <laughs> i mean he was a fair yeah. coach that one yeah, yeah bogey, the bogey team, bogey team of everybody at the time of course was port adelaide and uh yeah i, mean, I, I can remember going to the grand finals and um you know, Port Adelaide winning, and then Jack Odie came up with this style of play, and he uh, just failed the first time with it, and then the second time they overran him. They I think they won by ten goals, and God, that was fucking good. Was oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, but it's very similar. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how teams evolve and how the game plan evolves. I still expect some teams against some opposition to flood. I can see um, teams against, say, a Western Bulldogs, who are obviously very high scoring and very quick. I can see a flood happening, and John O uh, in the in the uh, YouTube chat, absolutely that Sturt machine in the seventies. Uh, I was lucky enough, Macca, to grow up a lot, uh, living across the road from John Murphy, and so oh, yeah. uh, he'd, he'd have bar- he'd have barbecues every Sunday with uh, all the Sturt boys over for a barbie and we'd kick the footy out in the front with all his lace-up victorian guernseys and swan uh, south melbourne guernseys and sturt guernseys it was like a dream anyway thanks Jono, for bringing that up. um so yeah i and it shows in the stats you would expect suns with such a high kick ratio to have a better uncontested possession count and yet uh, we did them in for that time in possession was uh even for the match 41 percent each um uh, marks as you'd expect uh, the Suns uh, in terms of uncontested marks um, were high 104 to 81 in total marks inside 50 though 11 to 10 so that was even and contested marks 12 to 14 that was even as well so whilst their mark count was a lot higher it was that chipping back and forward across half back uh, that they were getting a lot of their uh, disposal numbers uh, defensively uh, Surprisingly, the, the Suns out tackled a seventy to fifty-seven. On it didn't feel like that, did it, to you guys? No, no, no. no. I, I wouldn't have thought so. I, I would have thought they were roughly even. Uh, what was but it? We how, had the ball more. Well, how many more tackles did they have than us? Uh, Thirteen more. 
That, that is fairly significant. I, I, no, I didn't pick that up during the game. No. Yeah, it, we it, it are didn't feel that average, way at all sorry. in the game. Yeah, sorry, but we are sitting at, a, at an average of around about 55 per game and the Suns are a little bit higher, but that did seem a little bit lopsided to me when I saw it. Yeah, well, the, and uh, again, people just get my uh, mail first. Uh, PJ's got it. They were chasing tail in the second half. That, yeah. that's, that's probably where that, that came into play. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tackers inside 50 were pretty even. I thought our defensive pressure improved um, as the game wore on. Uh, one percent is uh, we had the better of, but I'll never understand that stat, so I don't think it's worth dwelling on too much. Um, and look, I don't think it can be underestimated that we benefited from uh, wits going down. Um, and that being said, I thought Burgess had actually did a pretty reasonable job um, for... Uh, he did. ...for the Gold Coast. Um, uh, but they I, they missed him up forward. But yeah. that's the difference. Yeah, but that's the difference. Yeah, you're quite right there too, Dicky. But that's the difference between having um, a guy that has a crack in those, like Burgess or a guy like Witsu who was dominating because he was giving uh, uh, O'Brien an absolute thrashing. Yep, he was. He was. Um, all right. Uh, I don't want to go through all the players. I think we're uh, we're just going to go through the five main play makers and a couple of players that might be on the edge. So, who's your pick, Nick? Who would you like to go with first? I I know what the coaches voted, but I would actually go Sloan as best because I think without with what he did in that midfield, you wouldn't have had what Tex was able to do. So to me, it actually came down to us getting back in the game and everything else that was slowing in the midfield. Yeah. And it's a real shame because the uh, AFL Live app on your phone gives you some really good individual stats, uh, but on the website it doesn't do that. That sucks. I'm having, a, I'm having a really bad night because I'm agreeing with Nicky. I had to slow <laughs> down as my best player as well. Sloaney, 34 touches, 15 and 19, seven marks, 10 tackles. Uh, eight clearances, 387 metres game, which is a really uh, high stat for Rory. Uh, yeah. Spent 85% time, uh, time on ground with two goal assists. Um, four inside 50s. Um, uh, Ten score involvements, which is a big stat this year, in my opinion, if you can get involved in a chain. Um, he had, uh, what's that, 11 intercept possessions. Uh, Went at nearly eighty percent disposal efficiency, nineteen con- like it was a complete game by Rory Sloan and the best game I've seen him play for quite some time. Noticeably, picking us up, showing leadership, and riding the ship um, halfway through the first quarter yeah. when things were going to shit, basically. Yeah, I thought he was the one that righted the ship uh, in that first quarter, uh, and he, you know, he had a bit of support as well from Keys and uh, Young Schoenberg did a good job as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I look. I I thought Sloney was the man um, because uh, that was you know we talk about Tex turning the clock back. That was Sloan turning the clock back. That's how yeah. Sloan used to play at his very very best. And to me, it's encouraging. I th- I just think I just hope the guy can play like that every week because we'll, we will win a lot more games if he played like that. Because um, once he once he got the ball moving in our direction, of course Tex and with the setup we've got now, which suits Tex. Uh, it gives him scope to move around and get the ball. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think Sloan first and then Walker. That's that's my order. So you want to have a look at Tex, um, Maka? Yeah, well, you know, he, so, he's uh, really been, re- he's been reincarnated, hasn't he, because of the fact that uh, oh, he's obviously a lot more agile. He's a lot more agile. That's the first thing. He's obviously yes. less that's muscle, it. less muscle. Uh, he's obviously I had injuries last year, but he's uh, fit. He's uh, he's much more agile. He's carrying less weight around, and uh, he's back to he hasn't just rolled it back a couple of years. He's rolled it back about five or six. Years. Oh, he's back to two thousand and twelve. Well, that, that's it, that's about eight nine years. Yeah, no, but he's back to that before his knee when he was just starting to break out. Um, yeah. Let's have a look at his stats: fifteen and nine. Um, he had took nine marks, uh, three lay three tackles, three clearances. I mean, five hundred and four meters game from your from your 
uh, inside 50 forward. Um, that's amazing. Spent 92% time on ground, so he was clearly fit. Um, oh, sorry, I just clicked the wrong button there. Um, so four contested marks, in, including that beauty that he took against two Gold Coast players, where he just basically cleared space in front of himself, protected the, the mark zone and, or the drop just zone. Just stick the bum. Yep. yep, stuck the bum out. Six so inside fifties. That, that was lovely, that one uh, you're talking there, Nicky. You just yeah. put the bum back just to hold him back and then came forward. Yeah. Um, but what I liked, um, he had uh, six inside 50s, 12 score involvements, um, 10 contested possessions, so uh, and two tackles inside 50s. Uh, there are some stats there that we haven't seen from Tex Walker for quite some time. Um, I think he's on top of the ground. I think he's loving his footy. I think he's enjoying what... Uh, the new group around him are bringing in terms of enthusiasm. He's obviously bought into Matthew Nix. And I think the coaches have, um, rightly or wrongly, uh, given him every confidence to say, as long as you're playing well, you get in the team. Um, and on form, I mean, the guy's clearly in front of the Coleman, uh, uh, probably, I would argue, maybe the form player in the competition at the moment. You Definitely. can't argue with it. Can't argue with it. Well, I, well, I don't I think you can argue with that at all. Well, the, sorry, Nick. I was just going to say, if, you, if I was going to tell you in the last year that after three games, that um, Tex Walker has got thirty coaches votes, which was at the match. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight is it? Sorry, I thought he had got the three. Twenty-eight. 28. No, he got, he got eight against Sydney. Right. Sorry, and that he's probably leading uh, the Brownlow medal at this stage. It'd be close. So, It'd be top three, that's for sure. No, he's probably leading it because. Um, no, he is. Yeah, that's... and that Sydney game we lost, and they don't like giving us votes when we lose. Anyway, so, uh, it's spitting hairs. He's certainly in the conversation for the brown light at the moment. Um, it's fantastic to see, and you know we've we've been one of his detractors. We've wanted him to uh, give way, but. We were talking about the Tex who was broken down and uh, just struggling, in my opinion. But I tell you what, this Tex, he can play on as long as he likes, as far as I'm concerned. And yep. and for me, I, th I think what he's actually doing, as well as he's playing well, but it's bringing those younger players in. And he's also showing them where they need to be. Yes. Um, and Nicky. so we see that from James Rowe, particularly. He knows that he, like, one of his goals that was perfectly tapped down to row. Um, and the other one was his snap. Nikki. He didn't even look at the goals. That's why I want Riley Tilthorpe in the team for the reason that you just said. Oh, yeah, I thought she's cooking herself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> bold yeah, he, yourself. He still has to show a little something, and he didn't. If he can tie his boots, he's in the team, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. How, how much would Riley Tilthorpe benefit from playing alongside Tex Walker for 15 games? Yeah, massive, massive. How much? How much? Unbelievable. Anyway, uh, we're not going to dwell on that. All right, so my pick, I'm actually uh, going to have a look at Brody Smith because I thought Brody Smith's game was a little bit underrated. Uh, 26 disposals, 19 kicks, uh, 7 handballs, uh, 775 metres gained, if you don't like, mind. 4 tackles, 81% uh, time on ground. Uh, Nick was very much used as the outlet, but also the uh, the deliverer into forward 50 as well. Seven inside 50s, yeah. uh, two score involvements, 11 intercept possessions. Um, his disposal efficiency was a little bit down, but you get that with long kicks. Uh, 10 contested possessions, pardon me, t uh, 10 contested possessions from Brody, which is always good, shows that he's engaged. Um, I thought him and Seedsman both had underrated games. No, I thought they had outstanding games, not underrated. I, I, well, I don't think I, they've I had, been given the, the attention that maybe they deserve because I thought they were instrumental in getting us back in the game. I've got both of those in my top five. So yeah. um, man, I thought they, you, you described it, uh, Smith's game perfectly and uh, Seedman's was pretty similar and uh, it was easily the best game Seedman's played for many, many a long day. Yep. Yep, agreed. Um, look, the others, um, a I, couple I more... Think... Sorry, yeah, I just, 
I was just about to say, see, to me, obviously, it was Tex and Sloan were the one and two. But after that, it, there was quite a number of players. I think you could interchange back and forth because I thought um, Keys yeah. was really instrumental as well. Lady was very underrated in terms of yes. what he was doing in and under. Uh, Schoenberg was showing bits and pieces. You had Harry. two days. He is my 2023 Brownlow medalist. I just need to continue <laughs> to put that on record because <laughs> that uh, I just want to make sure a, that I can say I told you so. It was a great little oh, even battle as to who you then put in next. Yeah. Well, I, I think Sloan and Walker, they were the top two. And then I think the next three came out of uh, Smith, Seedsman, Laird and Keys. And I, that's how I grouped them. And, yeah. uh, so I really, really got six there. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to argue at, at, uh, the order out of Laird, Smith, Seedsman and Keys. It's, uh, everybody will have different opinions on them, but they all played well. So I'll go along with whatever anybody says. Yeah. Um uh, the only other player that I would mention, um, and I know his opponent kicked four goals, but I thought Jordan Butts uh, was excellent yeah. going back. Second um, half. Second half was excellent. Yeah, yeah and, think... and the ability for him to um, obviously take on board the feedback that he was being given and not to drop his head against one of the premier tools in the competition um, and to basically dry up King's um, influence. Uh, was fantastic. I thought. I thought his game was uh, showed a lot of maturity for a young lad. Oh, uh, but Bunch is really growing at a massive rate, actually. Uh, so, is, so is mine. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say I can relate no, to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll say one thing. I'll say this thing about Bus, and this is what I absolutely love: his ability to just get his body and a, a little tiny push or a little arm thing. I. I always think the umpires are going to play an arm slap against him or anything like this. He gets away with it. He just knows how to just do that little bump to stop them getting a clean mark. That's a hell of a skill for a de- for a tall defender to have. He's going to be very, very good. I think he's going to be very good. Yeah. Um, look, I thought uh, the other underrated game, and I, I hate to say this because I'm not a fan. I'm, I haven't got anything against him, but I'm not a fan was Jake Kelly. I thought Jake Kelly had the best game that he's played <laughs> for the club for Love quite ball. some time, actually. Excellent game. No, it really did. He did have a top game, uh, Fiend, and, uh, you know, on that performance, you know, he, he's a lock-in. He, I thought he played very well. Yeah, and that's he's, a problem he's because... He's just that player we need in the back line, that structure. Yeah. yeah. No. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Look, a just quarrel in the team. The I want I know, in the team. Yeah, I know it goes against your grain. And the Warrior will, Warrior will make this uh, team because people will be, the play with players will be yeah. missing in, in action. You know, I think Hamill might have to have a rest and give him a crack there as well because I, I thought Hamill was probably one of our lower rank, rank players for the, for the day. Yeah, it just so flashes Frampton, in and, flashing in and out a bit, Will Hamill, at the moment. Yeah, like Frampton was stood out as the, the worst one and I... I actually had, you know, looking at it, I thought possibly Hamill might, Hamill might have been very close to the second worst. Yeah, um, look, I don't think Shane McAdam had a great influence on the game, to be honest with you. Um, he did get two goals. He did get two goals when it came, and yeah, that's the one thing. I guess so, but I didn't see a lot of other stuff from Shane, to be honest. Um, uh, Will Hamill, I think, uh, is flashing in and out. I think Will's probably come to terms with the role that he's being asked to play at the moment because he's almost Brodie Smith's understudy, really. Um, I'd, I'd like to see him grow his hair back again, put the headband on, man, get going again, mate. <laughs> he played much better when he had that. Um, you know, uh, and obviously we've spoken about Lockie Murphy uh, as well, not having a huge influence on the game, and I just wonder for how much longer we can carry... Uh, a low disposal count or a low output count from Lockie. We get a lot from him defensively. We get a lot of energy, um, but we don't get a lot of output. And sometimes he's not playing the role that he's in the side for. Um, I saw him fly a couple of times uh, in situations where he needed to stay down and get in position, and he didn't. Yeah, that's so, true. So, um, yeah, nothing against the bloke because his effort is unquestionable, um, but there may be other options there. So... Look, a good spread. I think the people that are in... Uh, we've already really spoken about the people that are in uh, in danger. I think Billy's in danger. 
Uh, Murphy, as I said, I think you're right with Hamill. He might be looking for a spell soon. Uh, and maybe that's how they get um, young Worrell in for a run. Um, Sam Berry uh, probably deserves to stay in on merit. Uh, I thought he was had a serviceable game, but he might be looking for a spell soon. Uh, an important that, goal. He did. Under a lot we've of got, pressure. We've got to have a look at Jackson Hately. We've got to have a look at uh, Luke Pedler when he's right. Um, yep, correct. You, yep. you know, so there's a few blokes, uh, and I think it would be good to uh, rotate the younger lads uh, through. I'd even like them to to give uh, uh, Schoenberg um, a rest at some stage. Um, although, isn't he a Rolls Royce? I just love the kid. He's fantastic. Um, but all in all, signs are good. I think the balance of the side is pretty right, um, and. Um, you know, a lot to like, a lot to like. Yeah, just one last comment there that um, Marco has commented Have we talked about Ben Keyes because he had a great game. Well, we have sort of, but one thing I do will say this about Ben Keyes. Ben Keyes is the epitome of effort, and uh, I think that he's uh, infectious that he that because he tries so bloody hard and he never gives up, I think that rubs off on the players around him as well. So mm. I think he's been a massive pickup for the club and... Uh, I think he's a great influence on the on the players in by demonstration of the effort he's prepared to put in. I agree. I, I would love to see him. I like he's almost first picked for the Crows at the moment, in my view. But I, for oh, his own for his own benefit, I would love to see him get a little bit more polish on his disposal because if he was able to do that. If he was able to just become a little bit more polished uh, with his disposal, he would be a gold standard, mint A grade midfielder in the competition, and he deserves to be that on work rate alone. Yeah. So, for his own benefit, uh, as well as the team's, I, I hope that he works hard on maintaining composure, getting his technique better, um, and just getting more value for for all that hard work. You know what I mean? Yep, and uh, uh, you're quite right. Just a little bit more polish on the disposal, and I think that'll come in time as well because, you know, he had to convince us that he was good enough to play in the team. He's now sort of uh, consolidated his place in the side. Now he can work on that particular aspect of it. Yep. Um, so next week, uh, an interesting round. Uh, we'll just quickly run through the round next week. Uh Thursday night, we've got the Swans and Essendon. You'd expect the Swans to win that, notwithstanding Essendon I, I, had a good win. No, no I expect Swans to win. Swan, yeah. Swans um, win. Port, Port and Richmond's going to be a cracker at Adelaide Oval, both coming off losses. Uh, Richmond looked a bit lacklustre. Port, I think, got it wrong at the selection table. Um, you'd expect them to bounce back. I think Richmond are going to lose two, two in a row on that one. Well... Um, depends, you know, it's going to be a wet night. Does that mean the old coach picks four tools again? Uh, uh, no, well, it might, might force him to actually select the right team. Yeah, look... Uh, he didn't bloody I, last time. I, I think that uh, if Port picked the right team, they will win. Because um, I, I was very unimpressed with Richmond, to be honest. And they didn't play very particularly well at all. Um, no, they didn't turn up. They, no, they, no they, spiritually they didn't turn up at all. So uh, I'm, with, I'm with you. I'm going Port. Uh, Bulldogs, you would expect, are in too good a form at the moment for the Lions, um, particularly at Ballarat. That's a fair trip for Brisbane. Um, uh, are they still in Victoria at the moment? Or have they gone back home they, now? Not sure. Probably I, think they might, I think they might still be in Victoria. Yeah. Well, they, I, I think they might be too. I, and, I, and I think Bulldogs, on what I've seen so far, uh, one of the most impressive sides that I've seen so far this year, and they could there could be a bulldog here. Well, I, th- I think they'll be around the mark. They're very hard to stop once they get going with some bulldogs. Um, St Kilda in the west coast at Marvel uh, gives St Kilda a few goals uh, because it's in Victoria, but they didn't look real good against um, Essendon. I was actually a little surprised because uh, I thought they'd be better than that. Um, so I think uh, the Weagles might get up on that one. Um, I think they will. I'll go West Coast, but I, I expect the Saints to come, uh, play a lot better. Yeah. Uh, Suns and Carlton. Carlton had the first win for the season. The Suns didn't look bad uh, for long periods of the game against us, but they're struggling with a, a few injuries. Um, it is at Metricon. I think the Suns might squeak that one. 
I, th- I think they will. Even though, yes, Carlton didn't look too bad, it's what were they really up against. Mm. Oh, the big fella full forward, if he plays like that again, uh, Carlton will win the game. Um, he yeah, but he, not... he won't get a chance to play like that again. He's going to be a, he's going to be a star of the future. Um, I'd agree with PJ's comment, the Crows are... They're not Crows, they're Carlton are shit. Uh, that, that is a correct comment, but uh, I, so I will go for Gold Coast, but, um, yeah... Gold Coast, Gold Coast can handle Crips in the midfield, and that's all they have to do. Really? Well, yes, if, yeah, you're quite right. If you cut a Crips out, they look very ordinary then. Yeah. Um, Collingwood Giants. Uh, all the form says that uh, it's Collingwood, but I'm actually going to go for the Giants here. I think they're just too good to uh, go for zip or zip four. Collingwood are only just going, in my opinion. So I reckon the well, Giants in that one. That'd be at the MCG, though, wouldn't it? MCG, Giants at 4.25. There's my smoky bet, Macca. Get on it. No, well, I'm saying that uh, Collingwood will win because um, Grundy will absolutely maul his opponent in that particular game, and uh, Collingwood will get first use of the ball, I think, and win the game. Okay. Yeah, it'll, it'll be, I, I think it won't be a pretty game to watch at all. I'm going Collingwood. Well, I'm, I might put a, a lazy, uh, lazy 10 on the Giants. That's my smoky for the week. Um, we've got North Melbourne uh, at Marvel, a fast deck. Uh, where I think I, I'm actually I'm looking at the odds here, and North Melbourne at three dollars fifty. I think that's an insult to the Adelaide Crows um, <laughs> because there's no there's no way in the world that uh, North Melbourne get close to us. No way in the world. <laughs> they are playing yeah, horrible football. Well, I think they'll play a lot, lot better than they did last week uh, because they were they were absolutely. I watched the some of that. They were demoralised, absolutely demoralised, and just falling apart in front of your eyes. Now, when a team gets uh, built like that, they do play much better the next week because you know they've had their asses kicked all week and grummed in there. They've got to go in hard and all the rest of it. Um, I, I, I think we'll win. But I think that they will give us a fair bit of competition for quite a while, anyhow. No. And yeah. no. Nah. Well, um, I, I I want to be wrong. By the way, I want to be wrong. Um, well, I but... think I I agree with you, Mac. I think they'll come up with with far more passion because Noble's lit a bloody bomb under them. I just yep. don't think they've got the bloody cattle. To be honest with you, Phoenix is spot on. Well, and on top of that, I, the question is raised in the chat, can Noble actually coach? Um, I'm oh, not so coach. sure. He no, he can coach. Well, yeah, he, now, he can coach and he'll have a good plan for some of our players and he knows what Nick's style is and what he wants to play. And, and he's also got Uni there who has quite a bit of knowledge on us. David Noble but has I been just... handed a shit sandwich by he has. North Melbourne's <laughs> list management committee. Like and I think they'd acknowledge that. That that list is an absolute mess. An absolute mess. You know, and it all started from when they couldn't transition out those senior players um, a few years ago and they've just dropped themselves in the biggest hole. They've made a couple of poor trade decisions, they've drafted poorly, uh, a couple of players haven't come on. Um and, uh, you know, Noble, I wouldn't judge Noble's coaching ability on how North are playing at the moment because I really don't think they've got the cattle. Well, that's a fair comment, actually. And no, I don't, you know, but in and the blokes long run... That I, the... Blokes that I've spoken to that have played under Noble, I, what he coached at Bays, didn't he? And he's been an assistant coach at Adelaide. Yeah. Um, they speak very well of him, so I, I'm comfortable that he can coach. So what do you think the margin's going to be, Fiend? Oh, I think it'll be 80 points plus. Well, PJ is saying it'll be under eighteen points. Yeah, um, but he's a pessimist. PJ, PJ thinks I'm taking the piss. I'm dead set serious, PJ. <laughs> dead set serious. You well, reckon eighteen points? It'll be eighteen points after the first five minutes, mate. Well, my I see a first half being a bit of a struggle, and I'll say that we'll end yeah, up winning. Yeah, I, I, I think that. I will win by about thirty-six. That's what I think. Oh, 36. Second half only. Come on, Nick. What do you reckon? I think the way that we're playing, the intent that we're going with, um, and if anybody caught the little after match they showed with Nick's talking to them, yeah. I think he's very much got this team focused very well yeah. on next step. 
we've got to keep making our next step. And watching the couple of things I've seen of North Melbourne, I think yeah. this is going to be, fingers crossed, yeah. a good smashing. Yeah, that that bloke from Hardware Unboxed, um, a a a, a uh, uh, much loved patron of uh, the Crowcast <laughs> and a, and a previous uh, presenter, he's got it right. He's got it right. We'll win by fourteen goals, and North will struggle to get forty points. And g'day to Tim on the chat. Uh, good to see you, mate. Haven't seen you around for ages. Um, so uh, hey, he's, he's the right stuff. He's the right stuff. Um, for those who don't know, Tim uh, runs Hardware Unboxed on YouTube. We've got a lazy, what, 800,000 subscribers. Uh, gets in trouble with big graphics card companies on the regular. Takes no shit from anyone. And uh, smashes big footy as well. So it's just an all-round uh, legend. Thanks, uh, Tim. That'll be 50 bucks. Um, right, Melbourne and Geelong... I don't know. Geelong are in under two bucks for this game, but I reckon that overrates their form. Uh, I would expect Melbourne yeah. to to win this game at the MCG. To be honest, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'll go Melbourne as well. I, I really didn't like Geelong's game against Hawthorne at all. I, I think Geelong will be in front, and then Melbourne will come back and and run over the top of them. I, I think that's the way it'll go. Mm, I don't know. I don't know unless unless Chris Scott um, buys a game plan from somewhere soon, uh, they're going to go backwards. Um, and Frio and Hawthorne to round off the round um, over there in WA. That's an interesting game. Hawthorne were a little disappointing, I thought. Uh, Hawthorne when, when... probably played to their maximum ability. I reckon the Hawks actually. When do, going... get, when do they get five back? It won't be this week. week. No, they got they've got a couple of players out injured. I I really did. I, Frio were bloody terrible. They played the no. shocking. They were shocking. And now they'll be at home and they'll probably reverse their form a little bit. But no, I'll have to go Hawthorne. Yep, agree. Uh, and uh, the only thing we've got left to talk about, Nikki, and I'll give you the floor for five minutes, Nikki. Five minutes. <laughs> We need to talk about the AFLW because once again, once again, the Evergreen Adelaide Crows women's team have just waltzed into another preliminary final and go. Actually, no, this is the first time they've had one, isn't it? <laughs> well, you know what I mean. <laughs> it, is, it is the first, <laughs> No, it's an odd-numbered year. We do very well in odd-numbered years. Would you just get on with it? <laughs> um. So we're playing Melbourne at... A late oval at twelve forty on Saturday. Get your tickets tomorrow. Let, let's pack this joint out because those girls need they deserve all that support. Uh, it's against Melbourne though. And Melbourne do worry us a little bit, but it's here. It's not at the freaking Casey Fields, which is a hellhole. They um, cleaned us up over there. Oh yeah, it was wet. We were a little bit too tall. Um uh, we didn't we play were. well. And I think it was also, it was a nice little kick in the butt that we needed leading into the, the finals. Um, uh, he was mixing it up. He was mixing it up. He was. He, he was playing around a little bit. Um, and I was still getting a bit frustrated with some of the setups we were doing. Um, I th- <sighs> Other people are like, oh, we're going straight in the grand final. I'm like, it's Melbourne though. It's, it's Melbourne. Um, and they... Um, as Luca Crow said, they'd love a Vic AFLW final. So, yeah, they'd love that. But uh, they've got a problem of Brisbane and us in the way. Um, and I, I think we will come through. <laughs> Fingers crossed. But I don't want to count my chickens. <laughs> well, well, what about, what about Daisy? Is Daisy playing or not? Don't know. I don't think she's back. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think she is. I think she could be the defining difference. If she doesn't play, I think we win. And if she plays, well, it's going to be tough. They've, they've been playing her up forward. They started off the season playing her down back and then halfway through they've switched her to playing up forward and she's and been providing a lot of their drive. She's pretty um, handy. Yeah, she has. It, it was a very tricky game against Frio as well. It, it It's a bit hard to tell out of that game because that wind was just... Um, 
put a, a, a lot of effect onto the game and the way it was played. And, and Frio, I think, have been struggling towards the latter half of the season, unfortunately. So, but no, Frio were still were still expected to win, though. Oh, they they were and they weren't. Um, because that everybody was looking. Oh, they come from behind. They come from behind, but they've started to peter out. And their last couple of um, rounds, they hadn't kicked a goal in the first quarter. And Nick, they get off the fence. On, For on God's sake, you've only got a so minute and were, a half. Get off the fence. They should. I want us to win, and I'll be there. <laughs> so it's a one forty Adelaide Oval. We'll Sorry, win. Mac, we will win. We will, uh, yeah, she's a fence sitter. I'm saying, uh, I don't want I don't to jinx think, it. I don't think Daisy will play, so I, I, I'm picking the Crows, and, and I think they will win. I don't think it matters whether Daisy plays. I think we are in good form. I think, uh, Manny yeah. Nix has thrown the team around at various Fuck. stages during the year. Um, but, uh, we're pretty fit. Um, we don't have a lot of injury concerns. We've got multiple avenues to go. We're kicking big scores. Uh, which to me is an indicator that um, uh, other teams are just going to struggle to uh, contain us. I would expect uh, Adelaide to win. I would expect Brisbane to get over Collingwood um, and uh, for it to be a traditional Adelaide-Brisbane grand final. Um, and uh, I think we've got the wood over the line, so uh, <laughs> Re all's looking good again. Yeah, um, and I'll, the one thing I will say about our forward line is, um, is that we're actually getting, if you actually look at the stats, I forget what the ridiculous number is, our inside 50s is insane in terms of the yeah. amount that we're getting in as opposed to other teams. Yeah, yeah. We've got multiple avenues to go. We're, our transition football is is fantastic and almost unstoppable. Um, it's going to take a very big effort for Melbourne to contain us. Um Anyway, uh, look, uh, once again, thanks to everyone who has joined us on uh, Discord. Uh, thanks to everyone also who's joined us on YouTube and joined in the chat on YouTube. Um, uh, aside from a couple of dickheads on Twitch, which we got rid of, thanks to those who are watching on Twitch as well. <laughs> um, sorry for the delay, but uh, you can get around us uh, on demand anytime between now and Sunday, of course, and we'll be back next Sunday night. Uh, all things being well to review the match against North Melbourne. Macca, Nikki? Yep. Thank Good night, all. Thanks for coming. Good night, all. Thanks, everyone.